Buckle up. This is guaranteed to be a wild ride. Welcome to Musicians and Beyond special multi-part series under the covers with Ernie Sheffaloo. This is your host, John Sarabian, with co-host Mark Lawhorn, and we are going to expose the history-making journey of the of this iconic figure in his contribution to the music and corporate world. Mark, part one with Ernie was awesome. It certainly is. And for the audience at home, I'm Mark. That's John. We're talking with Ernie Sheffaloo. That's uh, me. All the way from California. <laughs> hey, Ernie. <laughs> hey. Um, and, and you know, when we look back at part one, uh, it's the important thing to take from that is laying the foundation uh, with his early childhood influences, what his parents meant to him, what, what it meant to, you know, impress them and, and show them that he knew where he was going and that he knew what he was doing. And it led him to uh, where his heart belonged and where obviously where his talent belonged. Unbelievable. He's got a fantastic story. He's a great storyteller. So easy to sit here and do an interview when you really don't have to say that's much. That's right. That's right. So <laughs> I, I think without further ado, Mark, I think for uh, we should start part two with Ernie Sheffield. Here we go. Ernie, welcome back. Hey, thanks, guys. I really appreciate it. And thank you for the uh, wonderful words. You know, I'm, I'm glad that you enjoyed what we talked about it. You know, it could get pretty boring. You know, I don't want my, my life, you know, my, but my life has been nothing less than amazing for me. And there was a few seconds, you know, it's like depression. For me, I've been very blessed and depression never has been a problem for me, even though rejection is always part of, you know, that leads to that. I, I, I haven't had that many rejections in my life. It's more finding myself, you know, and once I find myself and I get the confidence that I need, then there, the rejections seem to go away. And I, and, and as, as I, as we'll talk about in other episodes, I mean, there was times that I would, instead of doing, you know, we would do, we'd get an assignment and do 10 different things. And I'm at a point now, and that, that 10 things would take maybe three or four days, you know, ideas and sketches and other artists getting in there and working and we'd present this whole array over the last couple of years, it's been, I get an assignment. I spend five, if I spend more than five minutes, it, it is amazing because the ideas come like that. And I guess that's what happens as you get older, as your career gets better or worse, or you get more and more secure in what you do and what you can do deliver the value you can bring to an assignment. Um, that's pretty, it, it makes it so easy. You know, solutions, I've got plenty of solutions. I'm looking for problems, you know, and the problem is never that much different than other problems. And I've got these solutions. Some I use, some are variations of that. Some weren't used, but didn't fit as good as they do now. It's kind of funny like that, how it's, you know, it just kind of flows now. And, and it all started, you know, way back when I was a kid, you know, having those people, Sister Mary Lucidy, we talked about her. I'm sure she's still alive. She's got to be 900 by now. You know, and but she 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 was such an amazing lady. And, you know, for a nun that and a kid saying that about, you know, having that love for a nun and no fear, you know, uh, is pretty amazing. And, and, and I've had people like that in my whole career and and probably one of the most important ones is Bonnie, my wife. She's been a very big influence in uh, my life, in my career. Um, we're going back to San Jose. I'm, um, I'm 18. Um, I'm on a double date with my date and my best friend's girlfriend, and it's Bonnie. And we're in my 57 Chevy. And, you know, and, and by now I'm starting art school, but my best friend and, you know, Steve Eptimus is dating this woman, the girl. And when I remember pulling up in front of her house and she came out with my friend and her father, who wanted to see who was in the car, right? And um, I looked at her and I, at that moment, at that second, I knew that she, I fell in love with her and I knew that she was, I was gonna spend the rest of my life with her, Wow. okay? And she gets in the back seat, we go to the drive-in and we're there and, and I can't, everybody else watching the movie, I'm looking through the rear view mirror at her. No, she's not looking at me, she's looking at the movie, she's looking at her boyfriend. 
And um, at a certain point during the intermission, my best friend, her date, and my date go to the concession stand. And this is the honest to God truth. I turn around and I looked at her and I said, you know what? You're the most beautiful woman I've ever seen in my life. I'm absolutely in love with you. I want you to marry me. And she looked at me and she said, you know what? You're the biggest creep I've ever met in my whole life hitting on your best friend's girlfriend. Wow. I turned around. I never said another word. They came back from the and I was like, please, God, I'll, I'll say three Hail Marys and an Our Father if I you repent. don't have her say anything to anybody, okay? And she didn't. And, but I never forgot about her. And for a couple of weeks, you know, my friend would talk about her and I would not. And I, I just, I couldn't get her out of my mind. And eventually, like within two weeks, they broke up. You know, it's like, all right, they broke up. But I can't ask him for her phone number. I can't, I don't remember where she lived. I wasn't paying that much attention. Um, and, I, you know, I can't, I can't ask him. And because he'd go, why do you want it? You know, go, well, because I fell in love with her. I don't think I can tell him that. But uh, so anyway, we used to drag the main. Every weekend, we would drag the main every Friday night, Saturday night, and even hardcore on Sunday, uh, up 10 blocks, over a block, down 10 blocks, over a block, <laughs> up 10 blocks in San Jose on Main Street. And so I'll never forget it. I was there and, and with a friend, and we were in my 57 Chevy. Look over, and there she is with her girlfriend, Kathy. So we convinced him to pull over, and I talked to her. I got her phone number, and, and we made a date. OK, and huh, I forgot I forgot about the date. I don't know how, but I missed the date. And so I ended up showing up a day or so late, but she ended up putting up with me. And that'll be a whole nother story that we can get into and the role that she played in. And I don't want to talk about that yet. I want to talk about that after we talk about this. And then we can talk about how this happened and why it happened, because it wouldn't have been for her. I would have never gone to, I would have never stayed in New York. I would have never created any of the stuff that I created. So what's the most influential, important part of my career? It's her. And we've been together now for 56 years. And uh, I, every day is just a blessing, you know, and we're, we're best friends. We're lovers. She's my harshest critic and she's my biggest fan, you know, and I think that everyone having someone like that in their life, um, is so critical you know I, I look back you never think about it while it's happening you know you never really give it a lot of deep thought it's just what's happening and you have to either react or not react and with her it was i had to react and i did and uh because of her i was able to go on and do other stuff and one of the things that we'll talk about uh this today is this piece that you see over here this was my first client my first, while I was looking for a job, I didn't know anybody in New York. I packed up a portfolio, a, a case that my father built, and I filled it with, it was beautiful, all dovetailed and stuff. He was a cabinet maker. He made this beautiful portfolio, weighed about 200 pounds. So I had to schlep it, and he had a handle on it, and all, it was cool, man. It was really cool. And I would go on these interviews, and I'd have all this work. And I had, you know, the, the city of San Pablo was one of the things that I featured and some of the Dixie stuff that I did and, and some school projects. And I, before I went to New York, uh, I, I stayed in college an extra year to build a portfolio. And I taught a watercolor class, okay, because I really like watercolor and, and they gave me a class to teach. And that was, that was amazing because, like I said before, we, our campus looked like something out of prehistoric times with all these weird plants and stuff. And we'd go off, everybody be high, and we'd go off onto the campus and sit there drawing and painting. <laughs> it was great. It was great teaching the class. But I was also building a portfolio, you know, because I knew that if I was going to go to New York, I needed to build a portfolio. So I graduated, uh, spent that extra year, that at the end of the school year in, in June, I packed up my portfolio and went off to New York. And um, the deal was that Bonnie, we were, had already been now together six years. We had living together for the last couple of years in Oakland while I was in college. She was an accountant. She worked at Capwell's, a department store there. And, and I went to school full time and taught and built a portfolio. And, and so 
the deal with her was that she was going to stay there and um, I was going to go to New York and I was going to bring it to its knees because I was now the best. Okay. I graduated top of my class in advertising. I was, you know, I was on top of the world. My confidence, I had a wheelbarrow that I carried my cojones around. It. I was so, so full of myself. And I knew that New York was just another, you know, thing that I had to conquer. And it would happen just like it did all the other times. I'd be the guy out of 2,000 people to win the city of San Pablo's logo. I'd be the guy. I'd go to New York. They'd fight over me. I would be carried out like a conquering hero, bring it to its knees, and bring Bonnie to New York, and we'd live happily ever after. Uh, it didn't happen like that at all. Not at all. And it was like two. Uh, and I had made appointments when I was building the portfolio in, in Oakland. I would reach out to agencies in Manhattan and, and introduce myself, make an appointment to see, you know, a creative director or something and show them my work. And I had set up maybe half a dozen or so. And then I figured I'd, you know, just cold call, you know, show up, see what happened. Woody Allen said 80% of it's showing up. If you show up, you got a 20, you know, 80% chance of getting it. So I just stupid me. Never real. I'd never really been out of San Jose, man. That was the biggest city, you know. I mean, and in Oakland, Oakland was probably a little bit bigger, but I never really been out of California, and I had no idea, you know, of what I was in store for. I, I just New York was another place. Never really gave it a lot of thought. That's where all the ad agencies are. So how hard would it be for the greatest guy from California to get a job where everybody's in advertising? I mean, they're going to fight for me, you know. So. After, after almost two weeks of total rejection uh, and kafa, I decided that it wasn't going to, I made a big mistake. I made a really big mistake. I didn't know anybody. I went there. I got a place in Brooklyn, you know, on Court Street, State and Court, and used to think that I could get on any subway train going into Manhattan. And if, as long as I stayed on it long enough and if it was pointed in the right direction, I would eventually get to where I needed to be. And man, I ended up in some weird places, man. Weird Bowling Green and all these weird Harlem. You know, it was kind of crazy. Me with in Harlem with this 200 pound portfolio, you know, I mean, it's like, are you kidding me? So anyway, uh, you know, uh, I called her and I told her, you know, I said, you know, I've made a big mistake. Um, and I, I, I'm going to come home, I'm going to book a flight, I'm going to come home, and I've already worked at Walter Landers, I know I could go back there, I know I could get a job, and there's a few agencies around, you know, I could be a freelancer, we're near, her folks lived in San Jose, mine did in San Jose, all our friends were in Oakland, we had a great apartment there, and uh, I said, I'm just going to, you know, made a big mistake, and, and I wasn't really as great as I thought I was, you know, I had to kind of admit that to her. And, and again, up to now, she had been a hundred percent, you know, for it, you know, yeah, go do it. I'll wait here. I'll hold down the fort. We'll go there. We'll live happily ever after. It's going to be awesome. And I had convinced her. I, I convinced myself. I convinced her. So I was a pretty good salesman on top of it. So anyway, <laughs> she listened to my sobbing and self-pity. And she said to me, well, you can go ahead and come on back, but I'm not going to be here when you come back. And I'm like, what do you mean you're not going to be? Where are you going? Are you, you going to pick me up at the airport? <laughs> I mean, what, how am I going to get home? And she said, no, you don't get it. You know, I, I don't want to, right now, you're running away from adversity. I don't want to spend the rest of my life with somebody like that. Somebody that every time they face a brick wall, they're going to turn around and run the other way. I can't live like that. I can't live with anybody like that. And I got, I, you got to be kidding. I mean, I'm not running away. I'm just, uh, you know, maybe I'll get a few chops and we'll try it again. And she said, no, you're running away. And running away is like lying. It becomes very easy. It's like cocaine. Very easy. You know, once you get used to it, it's actually your friend. And you can really hide behind it as much as you need to whether it's a lie or it's another line, you know, it's an easy thing to happen. And I don't want to, I've never seen that side of you. 
And I'm not going to live with someone that's like that. Now I'm seeing a side of you that I never saw before. And I'm not going to live like that. And I couldn't believe it. I honestly, God, guys, I, it was so like that's somebody that's punched that's me that's in the heart. It's yeah. Love. I mean, she, she called you out on it. Yeah. We had been together for six years. And that really was a turning point in your life. Oh, it was a real, yeah, it was a kick in the cojones. Yeah. It, it really sucked was. at the time, it a, but it turned out to be the best thing that ever happened. It, she's always been my best friend and my harshest critic. Okay. My biggest fan, my, the one that'll tear me apart, but I never really had that problem so much before, you know, it was, it was never like that. It was never a life changing decision that I was making by going to New York. I mean, this, I, I had already convinced her that we were going to be the king and queen of Manhattan. No problem. It shouldn't <laughs> be a problem at all. I mean, it shouldn't take more than a week. Right. I mean, <laughs> seriously. So when she said that, I hung up the phone. I, first of all, I, I couldn't. She said, I'm, I'm not going to be here. You're going to come back. I'm not going to be here. And she hung up the phone. I'm like, oh, man, I couldn't. I, and it was like a Thursday or close to a weekend. And I had one more appointment that following Monday. And I, I could, I picked up, I must have picked up the phone 10 times to call the airline. Okay, I can get back there and I can convince her. She loves me. And I can convince her that it was bigger than I ever, either one of us ever imagined. And, and, and insurmountable odds. And, and she would have done the same thing I did. I could move a little of the blame over to her, you know. Uh, but yeah, exactly. <laughs> the story deepens. Uh, <laughs> And, and, and so I must have picked up the phone 10 times and then hung it back up. Actually dialed the number a couple of times and hung up. And I said, okay, well, you know, um, this is it. I mean, this is a turning point. Like you said, John, it's a turning point in my life that, and I could see, I mean, I didn't want to agree to it, but I could see that like lying, like drugs, running away is, is a very bad habit. And it's easy to get into. You know, I had an Italian mother that was like living with Kojak. When I would come home in the evening, she would go through my clothes. She would go through the drawers. She would, she had my room bugged, I'm sure. And when she'd asked me, what did you do last night? Well, John and I went to the, to the drive-in theater. Oh, really? What'd you see? Oh, you know, uh, whatever. And then when John would call the next morning and I'm sleeping, she would go, how'd you like the theater? How'd you like the movie last night? What movie? Oh, okay, now I'm dead in the water. You know, this is it. So I got really good at lying, really good and dialing all my friends into lying, knowing what the story was because Kojak would drill them and me. And, you know, so when I met Bonnie, she taught me that lying wasn't a good thing. Okay. It was, I, and I, and I was already addicted. I was a major user. I would use lies left and right and she wouldn't put up with it. You know, and after she got me through, after six years, she got me through that. And now I'm showing her a side that she never expected. So I, and we'll talk about this more in detail on the next time, but she changed my life. At that moment, I said, okay, I've got to go on this interview. I went on the interview, got the job. And we're going to talk about what we see behind me here in a minute. What you see over here on this side is a poster, uh, the first freelance job. While I was looking for, for full-time work in Manhattan, uh, I had Ernie, made- Ernie, Ernie, can, yeah. can I just, for one moment, just yes. as a teaser for the audience at home, you've got how many images up on the board behind you? And and if you could just describe them in one sentence, just to uh, give a, a, a sort of a preview of what they're going to hear later on in the episode as you uh, start to- Yeah, go well, what, the what this uh, shows is the first freelance project I did uh, uh, and then the first job I got with Carloni and Associates, a small agency in lower Manhattan, it was, their biggest client was International Paper Company. And International Paper Company gave them their national sales meeting for 500 people that would come to the Roosevelt Hotel for a three-day event. And his task was to create a theme and all the graphics for it. And... Um, and, and, and produce it pretty much. So, and what you're gonna see is, that's what you see there. And then it goes over to some of the teasers 
the record label on the label. We're going to be talking about that. There was, I did a label and then the record label and how that led to the Jesus Christ Superstar album and my career going from Madison Avenue to off Madison Avenue with 100% focus on the music world Excellent. and how Jesus Christ Superstar led to what you're seeing on the label of that record, which is the first use of the Rolling Stones lips that were then that logo was created in 1971. So yeah, what we're gonna talk about today is these pieces uh, and, um, and, and how they affected me. So the, the, what you're seeing over here is the first project they had, it was for the first health food store, 1969. The health first called the Garden of Eden and um, a copywriter that I had met while I was moving around in different agencies looking for that first gig, a kid named Ken Flint, we became friends. And he liked to get high and I liked to get high. And we, I had, when I moved to New York, this is <laughs> kind of weird. When I moved to New York, I was the editor of the school paper, right? For the one whole year, I created the school paper, produced it. Once a week, we produced it. There was a team of us that put it out and it was a big drug fest and putting out this school paper. And they, the school bought me a typewriter, an electronic typewriter with uh, the changeable balls for the fonts. This is 1969, 68, 69. So I sold that when I graduated and bought a pound of pot. And I, I smuggled it to New York with me because I didn't know anybody. And I wanted to make sure I had, you know, party time. So Kenny and I made instant friends and we lived next to each other. And he lived in Brooklyn Heights. And because this apartment that I had rented in Brooklyn Heights was on state and court. And so we started partying together and he was friends with these guys uh, that started this health food store called the Garden of Eden. So he got me a project and he wrote the copy for it and I did the graphics in it. I'll send you the logo. You can't see it. It's pretty small down there. It's an apple with two bites out of it. And it was kind of like Apple Records, but it was different. And so he and I worked on that together. And after I did that, I did another piece, and I'll send you that too, called Jazz on Grass, which was a bunch of guys that I got involved with that were real revolutionaries because of the Jelly Roll Press that we talked about last time. Uh, these guys were kind of the Jelly Roll Press of the East Coast, and they were doing all, and they had this concert with like the last poets and all these different uh, jazz groups, and I did the poster for that. And then I got a job. I went on an interview uh, for with Carloni and Associates to do, uh, they had gotten this project from International Paper Company and they didn't really have the kind of look and feel that they wanted. They wanted something very poppy, very, and Peter Max was a big, big influence for me. I loved the color. I loved the composition of what he did. And it was during the peace and love, you know, I mean, it was synonymous with everything else we're doing in Oakland and San Francisco and the rock bands and the Fillmore East and Avalon Ballroom and, you know, all the concerts that country Joe McDonald and the fish used to play on our college campus. We were a mile from Berkeley and all that stuff was going on at the same time. So when I went to New York, it sort of, I had that kind of look and feel from my work. And Carloni hired me to create a, a camp to create a campaign and a theme for nationals, the International Paper Company's national sales meeting, 500 people. So I came up with this idea of like a Rockettes kind of thing, singers, dancers, skits. We hired Skip Redwine, uh, who wrote a lot of industrial music. We hired him. He wrote 10 songs about paper and stuff and Ticonderoga text, big hit. Uh, and we cut an album. We pressed an album, 500 copies. And I created the, you'll see it up here in the, uh, right here. It's an album. And I created an octagon album cover. And on the front, it was pieces of these women that were swimming that were on the top of the poster. Again, I'll send you these images so that you can show them better. But, um, and so I sort of created, and these other pieces that you see are teasers, mailers that went out to the 500 salespeople that were going to be attending this three-day event at the Roosevelt Hotel. And so uh, we did rehearsals, we had singers and dancers, and we cut this album. Skip wrote some great songs, and we put it out. 
and it was a huge hit. I mean, it was a really big hit. It won all these awards and hung in the Union Carbide building. Somehow International Paper Company was involved with Union Carbide. And so they, they had this whole showcase in their entrance to their building in upper Manhattan, where the whole campaign, the posters, the teasers, Carloni Associates, a picture of me, you know, and all this stuff hung in that building. Okay, so in that building, was also a headhunter company, a placement company that placed artists in jobs. So I get this call from this guy, Jim, who is a headhunter and places artists in different positions in agencies. And I'm already working in this smaller agency, Carloni Associates, and it, but it wasn't on Madison Avenue. It's on 37th Street near Lexington. I wanted to be on Madison Avenue because there is a, 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 a prestige that goes with that Madison Avenue big thing, you know? And so. Well, so you thought as a young kid? As I thought, even as an adult, as I'm 20 something years old now, I think I'm uh, 21, 22. And as an adult, for me, if I'm going to be successful in advertising, I got to be on Madison Avenue. That's anything less than that is not a success. Okay you got to work in one of the big agencies. That was the mindset. And so um, I get the call from this headhunter and he's saying, you know, uh, love your stuff that you did for international paper company. Uh, I have, there's an opportunity that I'd like you to, to send you on for a company that's on Madison Avenue and they're looking for uh, an album, a, a designer, a, a creative director, well, actually an art director at that moment. And I had barely been a designer. So it's like, for me, it was like being in the army as a private. And then all of a sudden you're like a master sergeant. Okay. And so you jump over all the other, you know, corporals and first sergeants and all that staff sergeants. And I'm now a master, you know, the position is calling for a master sergeant. And so but the most important thing that resonated with me was that it was on Madison Avenue. It was in the New York Life Building uh, on Madison Avenue. And so I agreed to go. I went on the interview. And again, like for Dolls Alive and other times in my career, it's all about timing. We've talked about this. Timing is more critical than anything. It's more critical than money, influence, talent, you name it. Nothing comes before timing. Timing is everything. And for me, the timing had seemed to be right. It's getting me on a path. Okay, now I see, I can see the path I'm on. I don't see the light at the end of the tunnel, but I'm near Madison Avenue and I'm in an agency. And yeah, international paper companies is their biggest client, but you know, it didn't matter. I'm, I'm on my way. So I, it's funny because at the same time, this guy called me to go on this interview. And I've never really said this before, but it's, it's funny. But when he called me, I thought, because it was such a success, we went to a Christmas party. Okay, in 1969, 1970, went to a Christmas party. And there I'm like, I'm like the hero of the party. I did a thing for an international paper company that won awards. It was hanging in Union Carbide building. Mr. Carloni took me to the side and said, okay, Ernie, this is, you did a great job here. I want to thank you so much. And, and I want you to meet with me Monday morning. Okay. And this was, I forget what day it was, but I ended up going on this interview. And it's so funny. We're talking about timing. When I went to this agency, it was on the 30, on the 37th floor of the New York Life Building facing Uptown. And it was, it had, was the whole front of the building was their agency. And it was kind of scary. It was kind of overwhelming. It was, there were probably 50 people working there. And I was sitting waiting for the owner to show up for my meeting. And I'm watching this head of production having three heart attacks and five cups of coffee and three packs of cigarettes at a time. And, you know, his job was to move the work through the agency. And I'm like, <laughs> I don't know whether I really want to work here. This is really kind of like us where I am. It's small and everybody likes each other and I'm a hero. 
I'm Andy Hardy, you know, it's great. They love me. And why would I want to leave that and go to this? So I'm watching all this stuff. The guy shows up, we have the interview. He's looking at all the, all the uh, dolls alive stuff that I did. And he, he, his name was Norman Levitt. He was an ex Marine Corps master sergeant who had retired and started this agency. And he had Decca records. He had, ITT Levitt Palm Coast, he had Ralston Perina, had Omega watches, had wearing, uh, wearing blenders and mixers. He had some pretty prestigious, New York life. He had some pretty prestigious accounts. And so he, and he had a shaved head and he, he looked at my portfolio. He looked at all the Dolls of Life stuff. And he said, uh, he put his glasses up over on his forehead. And he said, I like your work. Uh, what are you looking for as far as the salary? Well, so by this time, I'm already convinced that there's no way I'm taking this job. I'm not working in this place. It's scary. It's not what I want yet. I'm not ready. Again, I'm not I overestimated working on Madison Avenue because if this is Madison and this is what it's about, I'd rather be off Madison in an agency where I'm a big fish in a little pond. OK, and so I told him 30,000 more than I was making at the other job. And he was like. Well, he was taken back and he thought about it for a minute. I'm like, fuck yeah, man, I pull this one off. There's no way he's going to hire me for that much money, you know? Uh, and, and he hadn't, didn't tell me what it was about. He just asked what it was. And so I said, you know, 30,000, I can't take less than that. I'm already making close to that. And I was close 30,000 off, but I was close, um, you know? And so it wasn't a complete lie. And he sat back and he said, well, you know, I, we just, it's more than we were looking to spend, but I want to thank you for coming and taking time to show me your work. And I'm like, I was very um, humbled. I, I, I was, you know, I really want to work here, but I just can't take less than that. You're breaking my heart, but inside I'm elated. You know, I'm like, yes, this is great. Uh, uh, and so I was so happy when I left the meeting, I took a cab home to Brooklyn instead of taking the sub, the F train. I took a cab because I'm, this is great. This is the best thing ever. And because I'm a hero over here, I don't have to work in this place that scared the hell out of me. And um, I'm, I'm very happy. I'm very complacent. At the same time that was happening, actually, at the same time that was happening, Norman Levitt, I had my meeting with Norman Levitt. Uh, but before I had the meeting with Norman Levitt, or actually, I think it was right after. No, it was before. I had a meeting with Carloni, the guy that owned the agency. And I had talked to Bonnie saying, okay, man, this is it. This is going to be great. I'm going to get a raise. I'm going to get all this stuff. I'm going to become an art director, you know? And he fired me. And I'm like, and he, I, I couldn't believe it because I was so sure that it was going to be all great from here on in because of the dolls alive thing. And he, he fired me. He said, I, I, I know you're not going to understand this now, but um, this project that we have for international paper, it's the biggest project I'll have all year from them. They're my biggest client. Um, and I see that you would become very satisfied with just compromising your talent and taking this job and taking menial work and you're much too talented for that. So you're not gonna understand this now, but hopefully you'll realize one day that I'm doing it for you. Cause I could very easily keep you on, you'd be happy and you would be compromising your work. And he was absolutely right. So at that same time, I had gotten offered this job that I turned down. So it was like, oh, my God. And on the way home, I'm thinking about all this stuff because I don't really have a job to go back to after two weeks because he gave me a two week notice. All because you asked for what you thought was too much. Yeah. Yeah. And so I'm I'm thinking, OK, now I got to not only explain to Bonnie that, but why I didn't take a job for making a little bit more than I was making in a better stuff. And, and, and then how am I going to? She, she's already talking to the headhunter because he's calling her during the day while I'm at work. Cause I didn't want to go on another interview. I didn't want to be jumping from job to job, but I didn't know I was going to lose my job and I didn't know I was going to get offered a job. So I'm like in this predicament, right? That 
halfway home across the Brooklyn Bridge, I'm thinking, what am I going to tell her? How am I going to, I don't lie anymore. So I got to have to come clean here. This is really, I'm screwed. Lying is much better. Chances of getting caught are much less, you know? So I'm working it out. I go upstairs. We lived in, in uh, Park Slope on the second floor. And I went up and, and I, before I can even ring the bell, she comes to the door and she says, you know, Mr. Carl, uh, uh, Mr. Levitt called and he wants you to call him. And I'm like, oh, no, this is good because I don't have to explain to her right away. I can perfect my story and I'm on the phone with him. So this is even better. You know, I mean, this is going to be great. I had it and then I lost it, Vaughn, you know, uh, kind of thing. That's where I was going to meet. So I call Norman Levitt back and he said, I, I uh, he said, I talked to my partner and we want to hire you so i'm like oh my god you know one minute i'm in the toilet and the next minute i'm up on top again you know how could this possibly be happening to me well the timing was perfect it's just so weird how it all worked out and so he said if you could come in on saturday i think it was like a wednesday or thursday that i met with him and, and I knew I had two more weeks at Carloni so I could figure out a good story or get another job. And all of a sudden, this job that I didn't want comes along for more money than I was making. I think I was only making 25 grand a year. So I said 30. And so now I'm making 55 grand a year. <laughs> and yeah, I don't know. I don't know how bad it could be, you know. So he asked if I could come in on Saturday and he could fill me in. And... um. He really liked the fact that I had done that Dolls Alive album because he didn't tell me it was Decca Records. When I went to the that Saturday, he was there and he started talking. He started telling me about how these two art directors that he had had working on his account, Decca Records, <clears throat> had befriended the creative director there, a guy named Bill Levy, and was and had left his agency and was taking the Decca account with them. Okay, and he convinced a higher up at DECA to give them a chance to compete for the account, a shootout, okay? He did that not having anybody that could do the work. So again, timing was on my side because I was a guy that they needed at that moment. And it was either me or lose the DECA account. Now, he didn't tell me that straight out. But that's what it was. That was the situation. Okay. If he didn't have somebody to compete and there was really nobody, these two direct art directors had been working with DECA for about a year and they had become good friends. And I became good friends with Bill Levy after that as well. But, and he was a great guy, he really taught me how to be a creative director and, and how to direct people and, and come up with ideas and make them meaningful in the record business. Because now the record business looked like it was going to be something that was going to bring in a lot of work. Okay. That was going to change my career. Cause I'm going this way. And all of a sudden it goes like that and like this. And so he tells me, you know, that there's going to be a shootout. He said it's with Decca records. We didn't know what the assignment was going to be. The competition was going to be. So we go to this Monday. He fills me in as much as he can. We go to a meeting at Decca records on Monday with Bill Levy's office. And he comes in and he fills me and Norman in on this project. They've agreed to a shootout between your agency and these other guys' agency. The project is, uh, we've got these two English guys that nobody had ever heard of, Tim Rice and Andrew Lloyd Webber. And they have this album called Jesus Christ Superstar that we're not really sure we want to really do because it's going to be really controversial. This is, you know, this is going to be really different than everybody knows different than what the Bible says, different than what you've learned. This is a whole different way. This is a 70s way of looking, a hippie, if you will, way of looking at religion and what has been indoctrinated into us. So, you know, he, he, he's filling us in on this. It was at that moment, it was a three album set. But because it was Tim Rice and Andrew Lloyd Webber and nobody had ever heard of him, they cut it to two. And so it was a twin album. And um, so he said, now that you've been briefed, when do you want to make a presentation? And I said, 
before Norman could say anything, I was like, sometimes my mouth is in gear before my brain is. So I said, well, when are the other guys making a presentation? I mean, Jesus Christ, superstar, how hard could that be? You know, uh, and he said, well, they've been briefed a week ago and they're going to be presenting a week from today, which was the following Monday. I, I just blurred. I said, well, we'll make our presentation on Friday. And I looked over out of the corner of my eye and Norman, Norman was biting a major hole in his lip and his fists were clenched. And he was really, he was not happy with what I had said. And on the cab ride home, back to the agency from Decca Records, he, he didn't pull any punches. You know, he really reamed me, said, you, you, you made a commitment. This is an important client to me. It's been an important client for all these years. And you're giving yourself four days to come up with the biggest project that I've ever had at the most desperate time that I've ever had with this client. And you've just thrown it away in four days. And I, I you know, I said, oh, it felt right to me, you know, uh, and, he, and he said, yeah, I'm gambling a lot on you. And it's up to you now. And for four days, you'd have thought I had uh, leprosy or something. Nobody came near me. Nobody talked to me. Nobody, I mean, he was not, I would say, good morning, Norman. Good evening, Norman. Because I was there before anybody got there. And I was there after everybody left. And they had put me in a corner uh, all by myself. And so I did a lot of praying. I did a lot of soul searching. I visited two or three churches. And... Uh, I came up with five different ideas, two of which I liked better than the angels. But when we made the presentation, Bill Levy fell in love with it. Norman felt Norman saw it before we were leaving because they, the art department was prepping it, prep, you know, matting everything and putting the presentation in order. And I had given him all the sketches. And Norman saw it for the first time. He he loved it. Cool. He just he just he shook his head. He smiled. And that's all he said. That's all he did. Smiled and shook his head. And I knew right then that he was happy with what I did. You know, and I felt for sure we had at least, at least two. The angels. And I had this other one that was like really cool with a big question mark in the middle. And it was all these Vietnam War and all these things that were going on in the atom bomb, all this stuff in this stylized image that was circular, that was like the angels, you know? Uh, and I mean, the angels came to me because I remember my grandmother had a songbook, and there was all these angels and stuff. And, and I did one. And then I thought I'm a very symmetrical designer. I love things that are symmetrical. You can sort of tell from these pieces that you see here, they're very symmetrical. It's what's on the left is on the right. There's a real comfort in that for me as a designer to a circle this is the perfect shape it's got no beginning and no end and it, and it, and, it, and i i feel that same way about a lot of the stuff that i do i'm not a fad chaser i'm not a trendsetter i design things that will look timeless you can look at that stone's tongue you can look at that jesus christ superstar logo you can look at the posters you can look at the garden of eden logo that i'm again you'll have them so people can see them bigger very symmetrical because there's a real comfort for me in that. And so when we made the presentation, Bill Levy fell down. I mean, he, he said, this is it. And the other agency made the presentation that following Monday. And I'll, I'll send you a piece that shows what I did and a piece what they presented. And what they presented was like this line drawing of a, a bearded guy that kind of looked like Moses. And it said, superstar because they were really pushing to not say jesus christ because that would that was sacrilegious and they fought desperately for that and so yeah go ahead and you may convince bill levy but now you got to go convince tim rice and andrew lloyd weber to change the name of their musical and that ain't going to happen you know <laughs> so they were they were out of the contest altogether okay so over the next probably the next eight months, seven months, more, maybe almost a year. I worked 
with Norman. I did another, I did a beautiful I Aida, the opera. I did a beautiful package for that. I did a half a dozen other album covers with Bill Levy. And, um, you know, he helped me become an art director and, and a creative director. And he helped me further my love for the music. I already loved the music from being a fan. Now I love the music because I'm a, a person that's creating branding. I've created Jesus Christ Superstar. I've created the Rolling Stones ton. Those are some of the biggest icons like in, in music history. Now, let me, you know? let me, let me ask you, um, Ernie, when you, when you, um, when you, yeah, I'm like that. They they get me all the time for touching buttons. I touch a button, everything's screwed. <laughs> I get it, man. I get I didn't it. Right know away. What this meant. They tell me not to touch buttons. I don't touch buttons. I'm you trying to tell John, always, let it roll, let it roll. My so. hands are always above the keyboard. I don't touch any buttons. That's it. Man. When they're not above the keyboard, they're folded. So when 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 you're faced with this, you know the deadline's coming up. It's coming up quickly. You're into the shootout. You know that you're talking about someone that artistically has already taken a chance by creating this Jesus Christ Superstar title. So you know that you're playing into their hand. How does the, how does the other agency, other you know, other than just trying to having a tie too tight around their neck, not know that you 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 can? It's a very right interesting that. question. I've never been asked that, but I can tell you, I think it's because they came from an advertising background. There's a difference between doing advertising to the masses and and doing artwork for music to the masses. It's even though that consumer of music is going to a grocery store to buy a product it's the same guy but it's two different mindsets it's Absolutely. left brain right brain and i think these guys were more into the advertising end because i had seen some of the other covers they did and at that time album covers were the perfect album cover was a photograph of the artist or the group and their name in the top third right. <laughs> that was the perfect because if it's set in the bin and you're going through the bin, you only see that top part. That's and we were breaking all the rules. Yeah. And as we got into Pacific Ioneer, and we're going to be talking about in upcoming episodes, we we were what you would call at that time we were we were trendsetters. We were breaking the rules. Today you're considered disruptive. Right. <laughs> I would say that my whole career has been disruptive. I don't go where most people would go. I do what my heart tells me to do. And I've been blessed enough times to be right to where I've been able to build a career out of that. And the more the years go by, like we talked about earlier, now, instead of taking days, I take minutes to come up with solutions. It's just like that. And I'll, I'll actually, I'll, if I make a major presentation, I feel guilty. So I'll do the first one, which is right back. Then I'll do three or four more just to make them know that there's some thinking that went into it. It wasn't because that's one of the reasons why agencies charge so much money. They take so much time to do stuff because if it really was sold the way it came up so quickly, they wouldn't be able to get the fees that they get. I mean, it's not, I'm not unusual. I'm sure that everybody that does what I do that's been in as long as I've done it has some success feels the same way. It's just, there's only so many problems. There's only so many solutions for those problems. And it's a matter of having, I was once telling somebody, I have two or three big boxes of sketches that I did that were never bought. And I never threw them away because I always thought, well, someday, I'm not going to be able to slap my ass with both hands and I'm going to need an idea. <laughs> okay. So I can bring down that box because it says Ernie's idea is real big on the outside. So there's no guessing what it is. And I've got thousands. Of I can go through those boxes and I'll find a solution. It might've been for somebody else, but it's a solution. It's going to now. fit somewhere along the line. No, no, no. And, and you're, you're going to think about that and say, Oh my God, wait, I know exactly what we're going to do. I know. Yeah. Now, there's only three boxes it could be in. Let's pull them all down and start going through them. And I may find something that I forgot all about that would even be better. Right. I never throw away an idea. Never. Ideas are like money in the bank. Okay? Because even if you don't know how to write a check or take it out, all you have to do is show them what you got, and they'll give you what you need. Yeah. And I can do that. I'll always be able to do that. I'm 77. I've never, I've never been given a problem that I haven't been able to come up with a solution for. Now, whether the client likes it or not, that's a different story. Right. Okay. Because I've had clients that I 
present something to it. Oh, this is just great. I want to add yellow. No, no, no yellow. Well, why not? It needs to be. No, no. My wife doesn't like yellow. We can't do yellow. Oh, okay. And your 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 wife had uh, a one semester of art in junior college. Okay, so we should definitely. We should. Meanwhile, millions of people love yellow, and yellow is what's needed. And you don't want to do it because your wife doesn't like yellow. You know, so it's like, oh my god, really? You know. <laughs> so I, I, you know, I'm I've been very very blessed. I've been very very lucky to be able to give so get solutions that are needed that are relevant. You know, I mean, it's. And it's all those years. And we'll talk about not only the music, the corporate, you know, for me, variety is the spice of life. Well, if all I did every day was an album cover, I might as well go to work for General Motors, putting door handles on cars. Right, right. There's no creativity to that. Let's just remind the audience at home. This is uh, part two of a series covering the life, the work and the journey that Ernie Sheffalo has been on. In the advertising world, in the album cover, uh, artwork uh, world, in, in in so many ways, he's touched upon so many different things in this series or this episode or this part two of our series that you got to be you got to be reminded that you know he came from a small humble beginning up in San Jose, California. His parents brought him up. He met a beautiful girl, Bonnie. He's touched on how she was the greatest influence in his life and how that made sure that he stayed on track and stayed with his nose to the grindstone working towards what he wanted. And we'll learn more about where that work goes to in episode or part three. Got to remember these are part, not episodes. <laughs> so yeah. it, it's wonderful to hear the stories that you're telling us, Ernie, and it's, it's awfully uh, exciting to hear how the, the, the world of advertising works and how you found a way to make it... Uh, in, in a different realm or in a different aspect of it than, than most people would normally go down. And yeah. And it's really funny because at, at 26, I started my own company. 26 and years I, old. And, and I never really, you know, we never, I put up $2,500. My other two partners that were, we, we all three work for the same company, vice president of sales and head of production and the creative director, all three of us left that company. We each put in $2,500 and we started Pacific Ioneer, January 1, 1972. We opened our doors, and I'll and tell you, man. Those, for those that heard the teaser episode 28 leading up to this series, you may have heard Ernie talk about how that night came about and how yeah. they made that decision. Yeah, uh, they, it was, uh, it was uh, I, uh, yeah. <laughs> we, I, I was going back and forth because the guy we worked for at the time wouldn't pay for an apartment for Bonnie and I. So she stayed in San Jose and I would fly home on the weekends and be with her. And then, and it's funny because we lived together for six years and we stayed at my parents' house. They wouldn't let us sleep together. You know, it was so strange. But anyway, um, I brought back some incredible mescaline and from one of my friends in Oakland. And uh, I decided that I was going to go to work for the competitor to the company that we work for, a company called AGI. It was a print firm out of Chicago that was selling board printing the same way Craig was. And I was going to go to work for them. They were whining and dining me. And that'll be a story that we talk about next week because it's very interesting how all that happened, how Pacific Iron Ear was led up to by not only these guys, but by Ivy Hill, one of the biggest printers in the business and how they helped us and how it all came about. And we decided, and Tony was going to go back to New York. Lou was already in New York, and we had pretty much had to get rid of Lou because Lou couldn't make the transition of employer to from employee to employer. And it was just taking up too much time, and we were really working too hard. And so we bought him out. And But, uh, you know, I came back to L.A. with this mescaline, and, and Tony and I now had become really good friends from not liking each other at all. Three months later, becoming good friends. And we decided, okay, I'm going to go off and work for AGI. They've been whining and dining me. He's going to go back to New York where all his connections were. And we were going to split up. Okay. And we had in the, in the interim, we had sold big bamboo to, to Lou Adler and Cheech and Chong. And we had sold schools out to Shep Gordon and Alice Cooper. So that furthered the bonding of he and I. And the mescaline, we decided on that mescaline trip that no matter who we went to work for, whether he went his way and I went my way, or we both went to work for somebody else, it was going to be the same ending. It was always going to be 
somebody else making the decision, somebody else treating the client like a friend as opposed to just money, you know, and it wasn't how we wanted to do business. It went, and so we took this mescaline and halfway through the mescaline trip, we were both crying like babies and hugging and saying, you know, this is your, you know, we're brothers, man, and we need to do this together. We can do this. You know, you've got the talent. Tony graduated college at 16. He was a genius. The CIA wined him and dined him for a couple of years, wanted him to go to work for them. He decided he wanted to be an advertiser. And he was a great salesman and he was really good looking. He was 10 years older than I was. And we just, and believe me, we didn't like each other at all in New York. And because we were both fish put in the pond together and we had to exist, we had to. And when I showed him the comps that I had done for Cheech and Chong and Alice Cooper and he sold them, we knew, and it was just days later that we took the mess and we knew that it was destined. We were destined to do something together. You know, he had what I didn't have and I had what he didn't have. And together it was like epoxy. You know, epoxy is really great. You can get the strongest epoxy, two pieces. Each one of them doesn't do anything. It's like nitro and glycerin. And we were nitro and glycerin, and all of a sudden Pacific Ironier became the matches. And the rest was like, it was a, it was better than any LSD trip or mescaline trip I ever had, man. It was a high that was unbelievable. Well, unbelievable. We can't, we can't wait to hear uh, what you have to say for episode three that's going to be. And it's not always about drugs, but it was that moment. It was that sensitivity it's like the Celestine prophecy if you've ever read that, that, that you know that it's that that moment when you're with somebody that's ready to receive and you're giving and you're ready to receive and they're giving it's that magic moment the drugs were just <laughs> it, was the so car, it was the car that got us there <laughs> you know and it was it, it became much more than that we decided that the name was going to be pacific eye and ear because the pacific ocean the eye for the art and the ear for the music. And our tagline was, our mothers always wanted us to be doctors. I love it. So that's that's how it started. And awesome. that's my friends at home is how you start a business. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. Bernie, again, thanks for, uh, for sharing these stories. I mean, the world yes. needs to know all these stories uh, behind the story. And you truly are a history maker. Uh, I, I thank you for that. I'm, I'm very humbled by you guys you know, willing to do this with me and, and, and with me, because it's not just about me. It's about all of us okay. and about, I, 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 we talked about it, you know, I want to leave a mark and because of people like yourself and Joyce Conway and, and some of the other people in my life, I'm going to be able to leave that mark behind and it'll always be there. As long as people have eyes and ears, they're going to see what I've done. And each generation is going to discover that music. You know, you are a history maker. You are our friend and you are one hell of a good storyteller. And uh, <laughs> Well, thank you. Thank you for giving me the opportunity. We'll see you on episode three. See you.